Okay, so welcome everyone for our COE race training. Uh, today we talk about OpenML and how we use this for sharing data sets, algorithm and experiments that we have in artificial intelligence and machine learning research. Um, this is a little bit in the, under the umbrella of the race um, COE Center of Excellence, and we will hear about this project a little bit later. But this event is also organized in basically co-host by the um, National Competence Center NCC in Iceland that we have for HPC and AI there. So today we talk about the following. The agenda is that I will bring you a little bit uh, up to speed what the COE race project entails. And basically also why it is in a way relevant for us to think about OpenML and this platform. So this will be a give and take, so to speak, of today. So where we will shed some light where we as COE race believe where OpenML can make a difference, how we can possibly use that maybe as a so-called channel, so to speak to channel, having an active channel to the communities outside of COE race, particularly those which maybe not previously had lots of high performance computing and exascale in particular thought of. And then the other end, of course, of the scale, um, maybe there are also people from OpenML which have, let's say, small scale or smaller scale AI models in deep learning, for instance, but then would like to use, for instance, hyperparameter optimization uh, with the approaches we have in CU Race on larger exascale machines or towards exascale, I should say. Uh, although I think with the top 500 that was just basically released now, we have officially entered the exascale uh, because the first system really is really with exascale performance and number one. But of course, um, the system availability of these exascale resources is still a little bit limited, especially in Europe. But this might be changing in 2023, 2024. Um, this will be a little bit presented by myself, but the second part is then, uh, and it's my pleasure also to have here someone invited outside of race today, who is uh, Joaquin van Schoren from the Eindhoven University of Technology, which actually will um, explain him his, I would almost say baby, OpenML, because the interesting element here is really that Joaquin is driving and was creating this openml.org activities uh, since quite a while now, and he will bring us a very good introduction about this topic. And then in the Q&A session, the idea is really to think about the, the exchange, to think about how we from COE Race can make use of OpenML and how maybe OpenML could basically make use of COE Race. Um, just shortly, some elements about the speakers again. Um, so Joaquin van Schoren, as I said, uh, is an assistant professor in machine learning and uh, basically one of the founders of these OpenML, or if not the founder of OpenML on this platform. Um, this growing is growing quite significantly in, in terms of different experiments, in terms of different code. You will see he provides a very good introduction to this, I believe. And then myself, I'm teaching high performance computing and parallel scalable machine learning at the University of Iceland. But I'm also 18 years at the Uli Supercomputing Center research group leader. So I've seen also quite some AI growing on these machines since you know the last 10 years, which is quite interesting also through different GPU generations and so forth. And I should also mention that I'm the EuroHPC Joint Undertaking Governing Board member of Iceland. Um, and of course, if you want to know more, I put the web pages of Joaquin and myself here um, to learn more um, about us. Just shortly about the co-host here, you will hear about race later, but also uh, about the National Competence Center that we have in Iceland uh, that is here co-organizing these events. So basically you see here the competences of our National Competence Center in Iceland, building on the simulation and data labs that we have here um, in all the different areas of sciences from neuroscience, computational fluid dynamics, remote sensing, natural language processing is one key aspect in Iceland. So this is what we do under the umbrella of the EuroCC project um, that we basically building with many other countries. And we have a very strong interconnection, of course, with the National Competence Center in Germany. They are particularly, of course, with the Uli Supercomputing Center. So you will see that many of the members or the, um, I think the kind of um, advisory board members, for instance, as well, of these different labs are basically also um, then coming out of the Uli Supercomputing Center and vice versa. 
Um, then also, I should not forget, um, especially as Lumi is now in the top 500 number three, our strive towards the modular supercomputing philosophy that we drive in the race project by using prototypes like the deep system, but also like the jewels cluster um, that is, or that was Europe's number one, let's put it this way. And now we have seen that Lumi is um, basically number one, but still the idea and the methodology behind you see here is with the different modules and partitions, still relatively the same of thinking about different modules for different elements. And this is something which I hope at least here we can contribute within COE Race and with these, um, let's say, training sessions really to make users really aware that we can use exascale resources, which hopefully with any luck will pop up uh, in Europe in 2023, latest maybe 2024. So the exascale call was out for the basically, uh, let's say expression of interest to host in exascale systems. There were submissions to that. I can say, I don't can reveal how many and also I can't reveal from who. But basically, we see that Europe has a good chance of getting an exascale system in the 2023 and 2024 timeframe. So the Commission has funding set aside for this, uh, basically the EuroHPC joint undertaking, and there are member states willing to give the other 50%. But so for the um, future, so the future is bright also in Europe for exascale. And I should also mention quantum is also coming up to speed. Let me just go to the other slide set here to a bit get rid of outlook here Dip. and show you a little bit on the relevance for the open ml in cue race so um, this could be in many ways actually the relevance is as we are an ai driven so to speak center of excellence in the euro hpc uh, ecosystem of course we have many kind of natural connections to open ml and this means we, we do lots of AI modeling and we have nine different use cases and I will provide you some insights. Of course, I keep it relatively brief to really give Joaquin then of course also the floor to really talk about much more OpenML in context. But if you want to learn more, we have the COE Race website here that you can go to and we have lots of news and information where you can obtain much more detailed information that I can possibly bring today. However, the overall approach is a little bit, you know, captured in this slide. And of course, not every use case that I mentioned is using all of these uh, different pathways, but we can basically imagine that simulations like computational fluid dynamics here um, actually are data generators. They have big data generators these days. If you consider um, really tough simulations getting across many different cores and scaling very high, so obviously when you drop that to disk, it's also really large amounts of data these days. So this is definitely an interesting input that could be you know, an, an interesting way of learning from, from AI methodologies. So here we don't talk about sensor data. We don't really talk about data coming from you know, the, the real world, so to speak. So here we talk about simulations, numerical simulation based on known laws or known physical laws. And this is an interesting part of it. However, you will also see in one of my next slides, we have also some um, data oriented use cases in the project where of course then the data is really generated with large scale experiments like CERN for instance, is a large hadron collider or basically also in sound engineering uh, based on different ears of people, of humans. And then you have experiments around that. So we have a quite a diverse set of use cases as you will see but all of them have in common that they have one way or another machine learning, deep learning and AI at large uh, at their heart to try to figure out if we can do, for instance, surrogate modeling for CFD simulations. Can we do surrogates for wind wheels, for, instance, for example? And what does us, us brings and help when we come back then and closing the full loop, so to speak, to the simulation that we see here? But this is really a more or less 10,000 feet perspective. So let us move a little bit more deeper into the different use cases we have. So here you see on the left-hand side, those which are really driven by the physics or the underlying physics. So we have compute-driven use cases, as we see, they're really number crunches, again, turbulent flow in CFD, the wind wheels with clean energy and so forth. So this is something um, which definitely is important for us to understand how we can there 
introduce AI at exascale, for instance, as surrogate modeling, I just was saying in the wind modeling case, um, here we can see that especially a wind farm, so going beyond one wind wheel, is definitely a big challenge these days to compute, not only because of the turbulence, also because of the, the real computing it takes for these uh, numerical simulations. On the other end, then, um, we see that, of course, the data-driven use cases we have here, for instance, fundamental physics I was alluding to with CERN, or seismic imaging, also in, including remote sensing, so Earth observing satellites, which come with more and more resolutions by looking at to the Earth, um, builds a big case for big data. So what basically these, let's say, um, experiments or the satellites really bring is large quantities of data to learn from. And from there, of course, um, the computational capacity plays a big role because this is not something you can do on MATLAB anymore or on smaller SkyKit learn runs um, or doing deep learning on one node because then you want to do hyperparameter optimization and other elements of deep learning networks where then AI at Exascale comes again very relevant, even if those are not the traditionally number crunches, as you would say, and requiring lots of HPC resources as the ones that we have in the computer driven use cases. So hence, AI is everywhere relevant here in the project. You see here all the nine use cases. Um, the basically computational aspect should be not forgotten on it. So what we drive particularly in race is to see how we scale up really towards extra scale uh, to think about the future. Where can we make a difference uh, by using HPC at large? So here we're talking not about AI in the sense of using maybe one GPU. Here we're thinking much more of can we interconnect different GPUs, for instance, 128 GPUs in parallel at the same time and more in order to solve the you know, image recognition problem, for instance. But then, of course, the problem comes with the different parameters in all of these models. So the elements you see here is largely standing for all the different AI models we basically develop in the project, which obviously is different between all the different use cases. And this is one of the ideas already where, you know, OpenML and sharing those experiments that we see here could be an interesting interface. So that is something we will learn later a little bit what OpenML is. But what we believe is we have something to offer to put into the OpenML platform. Um, there, of course, to reusable or in, in terms of reusability, there the question would be what is the interface back to HPC machines? Something we maybe can clarify in the QA session or so. And of course, makes a big difference and to sharing that knowledge not only within our community, because OpenML is, so to speak, the AI community at large. So there we have a channel to a community, which is not, let's say, the majority of HPC users right now. And of course, this has some limits, but I think would be part of the discussions as well. So we do lots of quantum computing papers and research right now, for instance, in remote sensing. There would be also the question how that would be seen in OpenML how that basically can be done, because obviously they are rerunning the experiments in the OpenML platform is probably not so easy because the quantum D-wave annealer is there not really existing and things like that. We can basically um, discuss maybe in the Q&A session as well. But this might be another, let's say, idea. So thinking about all the artifacts that come out of um, basically CUE race. Now, how we optimize working essentially a little bit more is that work package two um, that hosts you a little bit this training um, is really closely intertwined with work package three and work package four which are the computer driven and data driven use cases right and there we have different points where we help with AI and basically back and forwards in discussions with so-called interaction rooms so however the goal from the overall project together is really by not looking only on this compute driven use cases and data driven use cases, but take also the software infrastructure into the equation. And of course, the very disjunct uh, hardware infrastructure evolving. So we have the large scale, you know, traditional resources we already learned with GPUs and of course, a high single thread CPUs, for instance. But what's coming up is things like graph core or what we have learned also quantum computing plays an increasing role. Soon neuromorphic devices will be also coming into the game. So hence we have a very heterogeneous setup and here to bring that all together and think about a so-called unique AI framework, how that could actually work all together is one of the goals of the CUE race project. 
And there again, the idea in this AI framework then itself would be how that links again with all the artifacts we create in this AI framework, um, how that can be, let's say, interfaced to OpenML, on which level we're going to do that could be another pointer to some interesting discussions where we also think we have lots of lessons learned to offer. One concrete example would be, for instance, that with a couple of lines within you know, a script using a GRU, you can also influence significantly if all the GPUs are used in the node or not, if you don't have these lines. So these are things which I think are of extremely value because many of my PhDs and my colleagues waste a lot of time to figure out these couple of lines in the code. And with this, we can have a very nice, let's say, um, you know, takeaway message or lessons learned really building to the outside world in OpenML, but also maybe other communities. So the techniques how we do this is largely with fact sheets, so 10,000 feet perspective, what's going on in general. And then we dive the so-called mural boards deeper into the interaction room process where we really clarify things like the business logic or the application logic, the data, the models that are relevant, but also then of course, which shapes a little bit then this unique AI framework design, the tools, the libraries, the concrete HPC machines of interest. So this is also where we have a YouTube seminar um, basically on or training on our YouTube channel. And here goes the marketing. Please have a look on the YouTube lecture. Uh, we we'll probably do this if you look this already on YouTube now, but if you want to see some others, um, come to the race channel and hopefully also subscribe to our channel. Um, we had lots of AI methods um, basically um, identified. One interesting example are, for instance, graph neural networks that are getting more popular. And they, in a way or another, shape then really the design of the AI framework with really methods needed by all the different use cases. So this is something where we, of course, not stay on this 10,000 feet fact sheet level. We really dive deeper. What are the concrete AI technologies? Um, and algorithms really like here, for instance, autoencoders or convolutional autoencoders or UNETs and so on that are then used in all the different use cases. So also there we have news on the website and also expose uh, this a little bit. In the light of the time today, I don't want to talk really much more. I think OpenML is a quite interesting topic and we can talk and you are keen can probably talk for hours on that. Um, but we will basically link it hopefully in one level here, somewhere where the different scripts come into play, I see that a little bit here in the middle where we have maybe an abstraction from the framework where we can link to the OpenML world and then with there can, you know, expose our scripts and our getting maybe some wrapper scripts to, to get this going. But here we really need to have more understanding of the interface, what we can do with OpenML to get the experiments you know, shared to the OpenML platform and maybe get sharing ongoing from OpenML, maybe to raise HPC machines and so forth. All a matter of discussion. And you see here the bigger role of the unique AI framework. There's a news item actually on the COE Race webpage describing all the details because in the light of the time, I would avoid to go now through all of them. That takes me another hour. But this is of course the key goal of the uh, race framework to really give you lessons learned into the community of using exascale resources with AI. Good, and this is of course published, um, just mentioning that of course we don't stop here with traditional hardware. We also look into quantum computing devices now uh, much more. And if you want to learn more, there are also different publications on that, but I'm sure you also will hear more news items about quantum computing soon from CUE Race. And that's all I would like to give you for as a role for CUE race here in the light of OpenML. And I, with this, I think to, to have as most time for the discussions, I hope you are keen, you're ready to share your screen. You're muted, I think. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, now we hear you. And usually we do this trainings here um, that we get the questions afterwards. So we would have time later for an intensive Q&A session. So um, you are queen, um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I like the presentation that you gave and I'm happy that you uh, led from the, the science perspective. That's also what I will start with. Um, because AI of course can do amazing things. We've seen um, 
versus recently DeepMind uh, solving protein folding. And so always the, the sort of high level idea there is that you have a problem, some data and you have a machine learning model that tries to map some inputs to some outputs and then you optimize that so you, you can solve really hard problems. Now, the tricky thing here is of course in how you represent the data uh, and how you build the models. I'm gonna focus on how, how to build the models. Of course, you need very good accessible data to do anything in machine learning. That's one thing I'll focus on. Second part is you need very smart people to build these machine learning models. And typically this is a, a very um, sort of tedious, I would not say, but it's a, it's a process that, that requires a lot of insight into how to build machine learning models, how to translate problems to existing machine learning approaches and so on. So you typically need a, a large team of smart people to, to really pull that off. The, the question we all wanted to answer with OpenML for a long time is, can we do this on a large scale? Can we democratize the, the sharing of data? Can we democratize how we do AI? Um, and so from a data perspective, that means give people access to really well organized, easily accessible data that's uniformly formatted. So you don't need to spend a day just trying to get the data into your, into your spread, into your scripts. Um, it has, it should have consistent metadata. So you should know all the details about where, where does it come from? Um, what does this, what does this column mean? Um, what does these classes mean, for instance? That should also all be very nicely documented. Um, that's one thing. Another thing is, um, we don't, not everybody has access to a large team of, of scientists, right? And this is a very scarce resource. So can we build automated AI tools that can help people, uh, at least for the tedious aspects of building machine learning models or the hard aspects that require a lot of uh, um, going through? Um, so I can't see half my screen for some reason. Okay. Um, yeah, and so can we can we also then um, build these these tools and these bots that can help people? So you you don't need such a large team anymore, but you can with a small, nimble, smart team and some help from smart tools, you can build these models much more effectively. Okay, and so in, in wondering how we can organize all of this, we took inspiration from existing sciences. Um, so you may know this. This is a Sloan Digital Sky Survey. It's a telescope in the US and basically all it does it slowly maps the universe all night long and what what's really interesting about uh, this approach is that they don't just store all the data locally or in some repository what they do the data basically gets streamed directly from um, the telescopes to um, an organized repository where you can where all this information is organized and anybody can go there it's called the sky server and you can just point to any point in the sky, see what's there in different wavelengths. You can easily peruse all the data that was ever gathered by the telescope. And then what people did is, well, based on this, they could build machine learning models to answer all kinds of questions. Um, so where before you would need to uh, first ask for telescope time, then do observations, and then do the analysis. Now you can do many studies by just taking this data, running machine learning algorithms on it, and really discover many more things and thousands of papers every year come out based on this data and this also gave um, yeah and since then uh, this initiative was joined with other telescopes all over the world this is now a very large collection of all uh, astrological data and there's even some um, citizen science projects that came off of this where uh, citizen scientists could also look at the data help classify what's there and even make new discoveries so how do we translate this to uh, machine learning? So the, the whole idea by OpenML is to really to organize all the machine learning, all the machine learning information in the world. That means the data sets, the models, how well the models work, and then really make this universally accessible and useful for people. So uh, we start with uh, first or, uh, democratizing access to machine learning data. Um, and so for now, we assume that there will be models. We'll, we'll get back about how we get these machine learning models. But for now, we assume that there are good models to analyze this data. So how do we create this repository of well-organized machine learning data? Well, we need to answer some questions, like which format should we store the data in? What metadata should be known about the data? Can we automate the, can we automate the sharing of data? 
into platforms so people don't have to do this manually. Um, and so looking at that, we thought, okay, how do we actually do this? How do most um, scientists, uh, practitioners in industry also do this? Well, if you look at how we apply machine learning methods, Typically, at some point, we have to convert the data into some data frame or matrix presentation. Um, most machine learning models require this to do anything. You need to represent you need to represent your data as a large matrix or some data frame. And so, if you have to do this anyway, um, that will be the ideal point where we store the data. Right? Um, so that's the, the so the core idea is that we don't actually store all the raw data in their raw, in their raw formats. We, we first transform it to data frames and then we store the data frames alone, right? Um, and of course, if the data lives somewhere um, remotely, it's also possible to have some kind of loading script that does this because we, we sometimes we cannot just store all the data on OpenML. Um, it's e equally possible to have some scripts that um, on the fly, transform the information into something open OpenR can, can interpret. Okay, so then we have um, a universal way that we can analyze all these data sets. Like we can store thousands of data sets in this format and do all kinds of analysis. If we have to extract metadata, we can do this across all these data sets. If we want to detect, for instance, the quality of the data, or we want to um, measure properties like how high dimensional, how large is the data, um, how, how many missing values are in the data. We can all do this automatically um, on all these data sets because we have one universal representation for all these data. And so we do need the expert. The expert is part of the process. The expert is involved to make this translation from the raw formats into, um, well, he or she has to write some script that does the loading of the data into some data, uh, data frame. And, but then from there on, uh, we can automate a lot of things, like, um, like things like cleaning the data or solving issues. There's a lot of things you can automate. And so for that, we, we have automated tools that, that can do that for us. We also need the experts to typically tell us what the, the problem is they want to solve. Uh, so that we call that tasks. So next to data sets, uh, data sets are basically just files of data. We have tasks and tasks describe basically what you want to do with the data. For instance, you want to classify some galaxies in, in, the, in the images. You want, you want to classify some galaxies or you want to uh, classify whether uh, there's cancerous growth in an image, for instance. Um, that's a task that, that you want to solve. That's the, the role of the expert. And the expert is a key aspect of this, of this whole process. Uh, but then from then on, we have these, uh, these, these tools, which semi-automatically extract all the metadata and do can can do all the, the transformations that you need. So if for some script you need the data in some other format, you can do it automatically. Okay. okay. And then um, when we have to give the data to machine learning models, again we can automate the process. Uh, we can have uh, these, these bots that. Um, create trained test splits in the right way um, that evaluates the models. And we can, we can from then on basically do this automatically. And this is gonna be a huge, uh, huge benefit because we can now automatically build thousands of models um, automatically. And we can actually automate the process of looking for the best models. So something called AutoML, which I'll come back to later. Um, but the, the fact that we have organized it in such a way allows us to basically take an algorithm and run it on all these thousands of data sets. As long as uh, the model makes sense on, on that kind of data, we can run it on all of these at once. We don't need a human to manually um, rewrite scripts to run a new model on it. We can basically do this all at once. And then when the machine learning models have run, we can then store also the models and the evaluations into the same platform. So now we have one platform where we have the data, we have the tasks connected to the data, we have the models that were created for those tasks, and we have the evaluation results. We know how well different models uh, worked on, on those data sets. And again, we can give that back to the user, of course. We can even, we can even store um, like evaluation results into metadata sets that we can then use for other purposes. Okay, so OpenML, in, in a nutshell, is an open platform for uh, discovering and sharing machine learning data sets, algorithms, and experiments. It's, it has an API 
Uh, so it's basically accessible from anywhere, from your scripts, notebooks, or cloud jobs or apps. Um, and there's also a website where we can go to. It's called openmail.org. Oh, it's actually now www.openmail.org. Um, and there you can just peruse all the data uh, that we have and all the results and all the models. Um, this is a snapshot of the website. So on the left, you see we have data sets, tasks, flows. So flows are uh, machine learning pipelines. Um, and runs are the experiments uh, often with the models uh, that are stored. We, we don't store all the models, of course, that will be too expensive. Um, but uh, importantly, all the runs are reproducible. So if you ever need to use a model, so you, you can store some models that you want, but even if the model is not stored, uh, you can rebuild it because we have all the information. We store um, like exactly like uh, which, um, we store the structure of the models, so not the models themselves, we store the structure of the models, all the high parameters. Uh, we store um, any information about dependencies, um, library information, and so on. So you can actually re rebuild those models if you want to. Um, yeah, you also have a search box, of course. So you can search all the data sets. So on the left here, you have the, the list of the data sets. If you click on a data set, you can also get some analysis uh, about the data sets. That's what you see on the right here. So you can see what all the columns mean. You can see the distribution of the classes and so on. And again, all this is automated and all this is open source. So if you think that you have an interesting way to uh, analyze the data set, you can actually add visualizations to the website. It's completely open source. Um, yeah, and if you, if you also, any other thing you want to, if you, if if you do an, if you do any interesting work in how to like automatically clean data sets or how to detect issues with data set, that's that's all stuff we can integrate into the entire stack. So in the in the back end, in the front end, whatever you want. Um, if you click on a task, you get an overview of which are all the models that were built on those tasks. So in this case, I have here a class a task about uh, EEG data, so brainwave data, and we see uh, on the right here we see all the different models. That we built. So people built models here with Scikit-Learn, with Weka. Um, there's no torch in this case, but okay. Um, but you, you can see that there are um, models here from different libraries. Um, some are uh, Python, some are R, some are Java. So it's also language independent. Every dot here is a model, so you can oh, you can also see like what's the range of performances you get for each for each model depending on different high parameter settings, for instance, you can see which models works best. You can also click on all these dots and then you get an overview of, maybe I can give a small demo if there's time later, uh, but you can also get an overview of um, exactly how this model was built. Okay. And so this allows sort of uh, what we want to, uh, to create, which is frictionless machine learning. So if someone in the world has an interesting data set and it's loaded in the script, they can easily uh, then publish that data set to OpenML. Um, so this could be this could be like a data frame in, in R or Python, and they can then use just to import OpenML, and then they can publish that that data frame back to OpenML together with some information about the data set. Anybody else? That's just one line of code. Um, and we have APIs in Python, R, Java, and C, even Rust and Julia if you want to. Um, if you want to download models, uh, you can then again with a single line of code, you can get a certain data set and you can directly load it in a data frame. Um, you can get the task. So that tells you uh, the train test splits and so on, how to build models. Then with one line of code, you can run any machine models that you build and then you can share the results again. So important here is that you'll see that we don't run the models on our own platform. OpenML is basically a metadata storage. Um, and you can run the models anywhere you want. So if you want to, if you need specialized hardware, if you do quantum computing, if you do um, sort of a fancy CPUs and so on, you, you, you can run the, the, the scripts anywhere you want. What you upload to OpenML is basically the result. It's like which model you build, how well did it perform, um, and some metadata about that. And again, uh, we have integrations in different tools. So we have an API, so basically any tool um, in those languages can be integrated, but we already provide readily made inter integrations with um, many um, popular machine learning algorithms uh, tools like uh, Scikit-Learn, TensorFlow, Torch, MLR, and so on. 
Um, so if you use any of these, it's actually quite easy to uh, already run models. I think I have an example, yes. So here I have an example for how it looks in scikit-learn. So you can see, I just import scikit-learn and then import OpenML. You can see the first line of code there, I create a runoff first classifier. Um, then I download the task from OpenML. So this downloads the data and the metadata about the task. Then the third line basically runs the code on the task. So what that does, it will take the data set, it, it will create training test splits, it will train a model on training set, test and test sets, store all the performance information into a run object, which you can store locally, or if you want, you can also publish that, open, that, that run uh, back to OpenML, and anybody else can also download it again. Um, this is the same example in Torch. So it doesn't like the, the, the code looks almost identical no matter which uh, library you use. In Torch, there's a bit more stuff, of course, uh, how you build the neural net. Here, I simplified things a bit. So I just uh, have a neural net that consists of three parts and I'm, I'm basically join them together. But you can also have the entire neural network explained here. Um, and then we also store the information so you can uh, reconstruct it later if you want to. Like, and this is true, right? So say I, I do an experiment like this in scikit-learn, and later I see this interesting, this interesting experiment on OpenML, I can, with one line of code, I can reconstruct this model, right, based on all the metadata information that I have. Uh, we do lots of other things with OpenML. I, I don't have only time for a few things. So one thing, is, one thing we do is benchmarking suites. So we want to do better benchmarking for machine learning. And one, one thing we always run against is no matter which benchmark you, um, you, you look at in, in machine learning, it's always somehow vague in, in, the, sense, in the sense that people select some data sets that benchmark some algorithms on them and they're done. Um, it doesn't tell you like how, how well those results were generalized to other data sets and so on. So what we thought about was, okay, if you have this large universe of data sets in OpenML, what you can do, you can, you can define benchmarks very specifically. You can say, okay, I'm interested in problems which um, have data sets of this type, which are between this and this large, which are between this and this high dimensional. Maybe I want missing values, maybe not. Um, so I, I, I basically specify a list of constraints that I'm interested in. Then I can ask of okay, which data sets conform with these constraints. And then I can create a benchmarking suite out of this. And then OpenL will basically just like add a special tag to those data sets. And then anybody can download all the sets at once, uh, run algorithms on it and share them back to the platform. And the nice thing is anybody else can do the same thing. Right? So if, if I create a benchmark, I run some algorithms on it, somebody else invents a new algorithm, they can benchmark their algorithm on exactly the same way on exactly the same data sets and then share and compare their results with mine. So it creates sort of a, like a social benchmarking approach where people can benchmark their algorithms against the same benchmark. They can also argue that the benchmark should be defined differently. So they create they can create different suits. And over time, we hope that this will sort of converge to certain suites which are accepted by the community as being interesting. Of course, there will also be more than one. And also nice is because more and more data sets get added to OpenML over time, um, the benchmark itself evolves. So um, we can actually track over over the years whether um, some algorithms um, were maybe the best now, maybe not the best in the future, or maybe they were overfitting before and, and now they're not anymore. Um, so th this dynamic benchmarking is also a very interesting aspect of this. Here's how it looks like in a website. So you can look at these benchmarks, you can find these on the website as well. And so this is, for instance, an AutoML benchmark. So you can see these dots again are different AutoML systems in this case, and you can see how well they perform. On, on different data sets. And you can, like all this information can be streamed with a script automatically to the, to the website. I think in this case, we even, I think we ran all these experiments on AWS, on AWS and we just streamed them to, to OpenML. And then you can, you can just follow the results as they come in over time. Um, this is one example, one example of a benchmark, this is called the CCAT, that's sort of curated classification. Um, from a few years back. Um, and this was meant to be sort of like a, a, an easy to use benchmark, um, which has data sets which are not 
not too small, not too large, no extreme imbalance, uh, no tricky things like grouping and blocking and so on. And, and then you can see uh, like over time, how many people um, submit experiments and you can even include older experiments as well that, that also were done on the same data sets. And so for this one, we have about almost 4 million results now. And you can see over all the different uh, data sets in this benchmark, how well different models performed. How about, yeah. Um, okay, so as a community, we have about a quarter million people who regularly use uh, at least the OpenL website and APIs. We have about 30,000 people which are registered. So OpenL is completely open. So you don't need to register for anything if you download things. Only if you upload things, you need an account, of course. Um, we also, we're also used in over 700 machine learning papers. We have about 20,000 data sets, 8,000 machine learning pipelines, and about 10 million um, runs. Short snapshot of the backend. Not sure that's interesting to you. I just put it here in case you have questions about that. Um, yeah, and then the last part I want to talk about is okay, so now we have this very nice platform where we can share data sets and our models. Um, the last thing we want to democratize is the machine learning part itself, right? Uh, and since we can now run any model on any data set that we want, we can actually do lots of experiments. We can see which models work really well on which data sets on a very large scale and really learn what works and what does not work in machine learning and use that to help people build better machine learning models. Um, so why is it why is machine learning so labor intensive? I, I'm not sure uh, what the audience is exactly here, uh, but just in case you're not so familiar with machine learning, uh, what happens uh, with machine learning when you're looking at the data set? You first need to do planning, processing, you need to select features, uh, or you need to create features. Uh, then you need to select which machine learning models you want to build, uh, or which neural architectures you want to design, and sometimes you want to do transfer learning, so then the question is, okay, which um, networks can you pre-train, and then how do you um, transfer that or, or um, build other models that are, are better fitted for your problem? Right? So there's a huge amount of design decisions at every level uh, going on, and that's why it's so uh, labor-intensive, because it, it is often not a lot of information about how to do these things, so it's often a matter of having deep expertise in doing this. But what we want to do with OpenML is gather a lot of information about what works and does not work so we can make really um, intelligent decisions about what we should try on this particular data sets we're interested in. Um, and of course, one way is, or one key goal of this is to have really robust autonomous system because there's a lot of bad machine learning out there. Uh, and by having these automated systems, having this large scale analysis, we can build really a robust machine learning systems that can also learn by themselves. So even if, um, hopefully in the future, if you're, if you're exploring the universe and there's no human nearby, uh, these systems are smart enough to actually build their own models uh, to solve new problems. Okay. Uh, more on human scale, um, we want to, sorry. Um, okay, sorry about that. Um, so what we want to, do basically is um, from the, the experiments that people do and the way they build models, um, that's very variable knowledge. So if we can store the models that they build in OpenML, we can capture public expertise and we can use that information to train a machine learning tools that can automate, that capture that expertise that, that many people all over the world have and use that to help other people build better machine learning models. So that um, the, the human users don't have to do all this trial and error, but they define basically the task. They let the, the tool basically do all the trial and error processes based on their knowledge and based on trial and error on the new data set that they're dealing with um, to, to do an automated data search and then give the solutions to the humans, which can then fine tune and, and control the process or add domain knowledge and so on. Uh, but at least have this automated tool that can really help them build better machine learning models. And there's a whole range of tools for that, like visualization, evolution, reinforcement learning, that you can use to build these tools, I'm not going into that aspect. Um, I have a book about it if you want to. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll focus on, on, on how we can capture this expertise. 
So if you look at what drives progress in machine learning, uh, this is one example for the ImageNet uh, data set, which is a large image classification data set. Uh, you can see that until like 2017, um, a lot of progress was made by humans manually designing and inventing new systems, right? Like VGG, like multiple layers of blocking, um, the inception network and so on, uh, things like batch normalization, uh, all these were invented by humans. Uh, but then there was a plateau. And then what happens, what happened then is that people start building automatic machine learning tools, which basically take all this information that people did beforehand. So we, we they took what um, what works in building machine learning models to, to design a search base for this case image classification. And then they use automated techniques to search this large search base automatically for the best models. And then we end up with NestNet, AmoebaNet, and so on. And then more recently, um, the best ones, they, they don't only um, transfer information about how to build the models, they also transfer information about how to train the models, how to balance model size and accuracy, and so on. And this is currently a state of the art. Um, of, and so this is sort of, yeah, um, so this works. Uh, this is just a point I wanted to make. So if we can um, extract useful information about how to build machine models and you put these into systems, these systems can really build better models as well. Uh, of course, this is only a part of the machine learning challenge. This is a nice uh, blog post that you can read. Um, so you, you, you can see the current state of the machine learning as sort of like the, the, the pre-industrial age of, of, of uh, aviation where we have certain uh, prototypes, some really cool examples, but it's not yet universal. Not, not anybody can use those machine learning models. So there's a lot of um, things we still need to do to make machine learning really accessible to anybody. And uh, one of that is automation, right, to automate the, build, the, the building of machine learning models. And it's also about efficiency, making machine learning models more efficient because right now they're not at all very efficient. Um, and also, Think about safety, like explainability, fairness, and cause analysis to really understand what these machine models are doing. So if you look at these automated systems, so automated systems for automated machine learning, what they do is they, they have internally some representation about okay, what are typically good components of building good machine learning models. Uh, and then with that, they create a space of possible models in a search. Then they have a search strategy that, that intelligently searches that space of models. Um, and then evaluate one after the other and then searches for the best model and then presents that to, to the user. Um, typically we have, this is linked to some library like Scikit-Learn or TensorFlow or Torch that then runs the, the models and gives back the scores. And then what we're working on a lot is that if we can gather all the information about um, all these thousands and millions of machine models that these systems are building and we store it into OpenML, uh, we can learn from that and we can learn good priors. We can, we can basically learn what works, what doesn't work and give that information to our health systems so that they can uh, give better machine learning models uh, for anybody who wants to use them. Um, so there's a couple of sub problems. So one of them is how you define the search space of possible models, right? This could be like a, a space of possible machine learning pipelines like pre-processing, modeling, post-processing ensembling, uh, or it could be uh, how you define a, a neural network precisely. Um, there's always a question that you can do this very generally, but then we'll take forever to search it, or you can use a lot of prior information uh, and then it will be very quickly. Uh, then it will be very quick. So it's always a matter of how you, how you design the search space intelligently and the better you can design the search space, the, the more efficient your automatically will, will work. Second thing is optimization. That's how you search. Uh, this space of possible models. So there are things like evolution, uh, gradient-based methods, Bayesian optimization for learning that basically construct the, the model or uh, evolve the model from a simple model to a more complex model or Bayesian optimization where you build a meta model that sort of predicts which other models may work well or not. Um, and again, there also we were, we were researching like what works best. And ultimately I'll come back to at the end, we want to offer this also as a service to the community. Uh, to have really efficient autonomous methods that will build models for them. And the third part is meta-learning. How do we 
learn from more prior information so we can um, create better search bases, uh, select the right evolution technique or optimization techniques, how to do transfer learning, um, how to do warm starting from existing models, right? If, if, if you're a human and you build a machine model, you don't start from scratch either. You know what worked before and you start from there, right? We also want automatic systems to do that, to um, start from things that, that seem to work on similar tasks so you can actually build better models faster. And yeah, by doing that, we hope that we can create this virtual, this virtual cycle. But the more experience that we gather, the more intelligent these automatic tools become and can help uh, machine learning models, uh, well, help create better machine learning models. Right. So high level view of that is that if you have such a, if you have such an automated machine learning toolbox, it could look up, okay, which data sets do we know in OpenL, which are very similar to ones, and you have different ways how we can define uh, which tasks are similar to previous tasks. Then we can look up, okay, on these similar tasks, which models work well there. And then we can use that just to warm start the search for um, better models. We don't just take them, we just we will we'll fine tune them. We will we will just use them as a starting point uh, to find better models faster. And it is already being used by a lot of people. Um, so you may know Auto Scikit-Learn, which is um, one of these uh, HTML tools that you can download. It's open source. So what they do? Well, they have two versions. So the first version, what they did is, if you give them a new data set, it it identifies some problems with the data set, then looks to OpenML, which data sets are similar to your data set, then looks at, okay, these similar data sets, which were the best models on those on those data sets, and then it tries those first on your new model. Right? So it's already using OpenML to build better models. In the second version, um, what what they do, they learn they learn a portfolio. They basically learn over the thousands of data sets in OpenML, which are good general pipelines that typically work in most cases, and then they do those first. That's no way of doing it. Um, Amazon has a, like inside SageMaker, they have a tool. Uh, what, what they do is they, instead of um, searching this very complex space of all possible models, they use OpenML to basically learn a smaller search base in, in which to uh, find good machine models. And then they use that to find better models faster. Um, Microsoft has also a tool, uh, it's sort of, sort of a recommender system approach. Um, it also uses, I think, 5 million experiments in OpenML uh, to learn related representations, like the, like the recommender system, like recommending movies to people. Here, you recommend algorithms or pipelines to uh, machine learning problems. Um, and that's, that's what they also use OpenML for this. And internally at, at CUE, we have Gamma. So, Gamma is a modular RTML system, it's not a particular method. It's, an, it's a framework and it can do different things with different methods. And we're, we're using it to, uh, to, to, to basically um, offer a service that anybody can upload any data set to OpenML. And then this tool will uh, create new models for the new data set. So you can see that with here. So here you can see um, its timeline. And then on the y-axis we have performance. Every dot here is a model. Uh, you can see all different people building different models. And then the orange dots are from an RTML bot. Um, so it basically by itself, it, it learns um, which models work well. And over time, it, it tries to build better and better models. Uh, and we hope in the future, uh, one, that these will continue to learn. So the longer they, they, they basically never have to stop learning. They can just keep building models on all different data sets. And they can also learn from what the humans are doing. In different ways, I won't go into details, but there are different ways that also the bots can learn from what the humans are doing, and vice versa, the humans can learn from what the bots are doing. And sort of a plug here, yeah, we are always looking for computational resources, uh, because we really want to release this soon as a service to the community. So anybody who uploads data set to OpenML, there will be HTML tools uh, that run in the background and will provide new models for every new data set that people provide. And these will should become ever smarter. Uh, if you want to know more about all the details here, that we have a book that's open access that you can read. And with that, I want to um, invite you to join us for an open source community. We do hackathons two or three times a year. We have a foundation. Um, there's some people in the, in the picture here, and uh, you can see. And I also want to thank the whole uh, team of uh, very clever people who helped create OpenML. 
think that's it. And I'll answer any of your questions. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, Joachim. That was very nice, a very good introduction of the platform. Mm -hmm. um, also good to see that there's a large community around this, or that, you know, basically this is a sustainable effort, I think, um, which we can bridge to. But we have time enough for questions. So before I have, um, I think, a million questions, but I would first say the community here on the call, uh, do you have any particular question? Please go ahead. Okay, Andreas was the first raising hands. Please go ahead. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the very uh, good introduction to OpenML and AutoML. Um, I was wondering in the in the AutoML. Um, so basically, I I learned that the uh, AutoML does a learning uh, or learns which of the models is best. Yeah, or uh, trains basically. Uh, let's say the, this uh, uh, or allows to reduce the search space. I was wondering if uh, hyperparameter optimization is also part of that. And if um, HPC resources are used for that. Uh, so do you also consider uh, running on, I don't know, multiple GPUs and uh, consider the effect of running uh, um, these models on different uh, GPUs um, on the, let's say, um, accuracy as well as uh, the convergence of the models? Okay, good. Um, yeah, so high parameters are definitely part of this. They're part of the search base. They're a very important part of the search space because uh, you can, that's sort of the, the lever you have. You can either do it very coarsely and, and just select an algorithm, or you can do it very finely, like, like a neural network, or even super finely, you can like, actually like parameterize components of a neural net, like the update like rule, and also optimize those. So you can you can go very deep. You can even like embed new algorithms this way. Um, so yeah, that, definitely that's, that's part of it. Um, in terms of HPC, we use HPC all the time. Um, so one of obvious ways, well, we run millions of models on thousands of data sets. So we all obviously need to parallelize. Um, the, the, depending on the method, that's easy or not easy. So there are some methods uh, which are more based on like random search kind of approaches um, that you can very easily parallelize. Um, evolutionary approaches you can uh, parallelize to some aspect. Basic optimization is a bit harder, uh, but there also there's some ways that you can parallelize stuff. Uh, and even if not, um, we can parallelize because we typically run these over thousands of data sets. We can also parallelize over data sets uh, quite easily. Um, we don't, we're not very much involved in hardware profiling, like which is the best uh, GPU. We could do that. Uh, it's just another kind of metadata. Uh, we just, well, there are other people doing that. So there's like um, Dawn Bench and ML Perf that, that are, uh, which are more industry driven. These are run by Google and so on um, and Facebook today. They, um, they, they're already doing that. So no, we're not, not putting too much attention into that aspect, but we could, we could very easily do hardware profiling as well. It's just not a bit of metadata. Okay, thank you. And maybe a second question, since you were talking about the data set and that you uh, this needs to be um, processed in parallel as well. Um, so you were talking at the beginning about the uh, data frames that you store, uh, that you're able to store. Yeah, you yeah. convert the initial raw data to data frames, mm -hmm. and then you're able to store it in your database. Is this, uh, um, let's say, uh, the, the format that you have there, is it easy parallelizable? Is it, so I was wondering if it's later on, if you download it, um, does it support parallel IO, so to say? You know, that? yeah, so you can. I think, um, I think, like one, one example, I think we have a Dask interface. So if you you can download the data frames into Dask and, and, and do distributed compute of them. Um, like the, 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 the tricky thing is just getting the data into your script. And so from then on, you can, you can basically do whatever you want with them. Um, so yeah, it should definitely be possible to parallelize that. Yeah. Okay, and, and you support uh, like huge uh, huge data sets yeah, that are uploadable to, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm talking about a terabyte of data uh, that yeah. could be possible to yeah. upload that to OpenML? In theory, yes. <laughs> we, we don't actually have those. Um, so I, I, I can't promise that. Uh, we... Quite a tough question also. <laughs> I try. So um, the question is always like, is it worth? Doing that, or is it just better to load a data a data loader script that 
uh, handles the, that aspect. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Sorry, because I thought with the task you automatically you, you showed this very nice script, which was very brief that you def define a task number and then it automatically downloads everything, the model, uh, and then automatically you can run everything. Uh, so I, I thought this was always associated then with the data set, which is then also automatically downloaded, but you can specify the data set which lives locally on your machine, right? Um... You could, but then there's no benefit of, of this, right? Then you just run, yeah, you, you, you could of course do that, but then there, there's no really benefit of, of sharing it. Um, yeah, at some right. point, the, the goal of OpenL is to share the results afterwards, uh, and then you would also have to share the data set, otherwise it's not reproducible. Mm. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. The, the other thing is very easy. So if you want to just benchmark your algorithm, and not share those results back. That's 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 so easy. It's just emitting one line. Okay, thanks. Okay, I see. Um, there is a question in the chat from Kurt. I think it was partly addressed already from Joaquin. But given the role of data loaders today, um, which also plays for race quite a important role actually when we do, let's say, a larger scale. Um, he mentioned, uh, what are the options for non-data frame data sets again? So if you have a data loader or something like this, uh, and not just matrix data, I think partly I've already answered, but if you can maybe elaborate a bit more on what options are there for ingesting data, which is from different, let's say, data types, yeah. um, sequence versus images, things like that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, so this is something that we're currently working on. Uh, it's not out there yet. Um, in, because in most cases, there is an easy way to, to load in their frame, like if images and so on. Um, it's very easy to do uh, a pixel presentation or something that, that you can load a data frame. And that's what you want to do anyway. Uh, but there are cases, for instance, if you do stuff like uh, image segmentation, uh, where you have, you cannot store them in data frames. So you need like multiple data frames. Or you can, but it's not economic to do that. Um, so yeah, we, we are working, so a data set in OpenML is basically just a folder of files. Uh, it's just that in the tooling, we sort of, in many cases, assume it's a single data frame, but we're working on extensions that can also work on these problems where you have multiple data frames, for instance. Um, um, there are cases, of course, I think even, I think it's, it's hard to think of cases which are actually not internally a data frame, like even a graph, it's at some point you have to you have to store it as, as a, a data frame to push to machine learning model like a Jesse matrix or something like that. Um, if you have text, I guess yeah. If you want to use models that explicitly don't do any kind of um, like text representation, text embedding, then you would need to do that otherwise. Yeah. So that we don't yet support. That's nothing that. Just not nothing. Nothing we haven't. Um, so it's not something we have looked at closely yet. Um, but it should be extensible to that as well. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, the floor is also open for others here um, on the call. I I maybe have uh, re regarding the the first question that Andy asked um, mm -hmm. um, about the um, yeah algorithms, uh, the hyperparameter tuning algorithms. Um, you would choose when you run on an HPC system. Um, mm -hmm. In this project, we have been using Asha and Bob so far, yeah. and they are actually uh, producing nice results. Um, I just wanted to ask if maybe you have, uh, like, out of your mind, uh, any other recommendations for algorithms we could try, specifically on HPC systems? Yeah, so Asha is also one of the things we have in Gamma, uh, so we, it's also uh, very nice. Um, a recommendation it really depends on the application that you have in mind um so are you mostly dealing with neural networks or yeah uh yeah i think it's it's neural networks mostly yeah so then yeah it depends so say for instance if you do things like image classification or a lot of uh, um, computer vision stuff there are uh, met methods just that, such as darts have you heard of darts uh yeah yeah like differential architecture search um, it's sort of a, uh, a better way of doing uh, neural architecture search because, well, in many 
methods in your lockbase search, you build one model after the other, and you need to train on these models, which is expensive. In Dart, you basically build one model where you uh, like a hyper model that has all the options in parallel. Um, and so that, that's typically much more efficient. Uh, so what you basically do, you, 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 uh, you, you optimize your model parameters and your higher parameters at the same time. Okay. Uh, that's um, much, much more efficient. Um, so I would definitely recommend that. Um, something also, we, we, we've been working recently on ways to regularize Dart, so it's, it's more generally useful. Um, yeah, it, it does depend, like the more, the more specific you go, you need a search base for these. Like this is, these tools that we have a specific search base for image classification models, for instance. Uh, for many other problems, there are no such bases available yet, and you're down again with, with more general methods. But for some cases, we have very specialized models that work very well on those. Okay, and I and I guess you you could probably adapt darts to, uh, for yeah. like I, I know that it's like I think in the in the paper they use it for uh, uh, yeah for computer vision and NLP. But I guess you could also adapt it for basically any kind of neural network where you have like the yeah like you said the structure. Um, of a, of a search space. Yeah, so the, the only tricky thing in, in using things like darts is defining a search space because you need to make it continuous. Okay. Um, so, um, but once you do that, there's really no limit. Uh, you, you can, yeah. If, if, you can, if you can define a nice search space for your problem, then you, you can automate it. Okay, thank you. It's like, um, if, you, if, you, if you like, um, in some scientific um, applications, there um, there's something called XZ operators. Yeah. So what they do, they basically learn new kinds of layers. So instead of convolutions, they use other operations. And you search that space of operations, basically, which may work better for uh, other use cases, which are not pure computer vision. Okay, but I, I guess this will make the search space then again like pretty pretty large. <laughs> it, it's. Yeah, it's larger because you're basically searching over the space of possible matrices. Um, but yeah, it, it, they have some nice results as well. Okay. Um, and maybe one, one, one other question. Um, you said that like you can, like with this open ML, um, uh, you have access to lots of yeah, models with uh, hyperparameters and yeah, lots of and their performance. Is there any, uh, insight you could uh, or, or surprising insight you could uh, like see from that data like uh, um, yeah so like something that that you maybe didn't expect that's a tricky one I think something that often comes up is that we often find simpler models for cases which look much more complicated. Okay. <laughs> like, yep. um, like one of these things is um, sometimes you don't need a deep learning model at all. You just need like a good embedding. You just use a pre-trained image net transform, um, embedding and then you, you do a machine pipeline afterwards. It often works amazingly well. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I would say that that's uh, already uh, interesting mm -hmm. enough. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, the last one I like particularly because also yesterday and, and the days before in Croatia and so on, we discussed that the shallow models you now are still valid today, right? So the yeah. support vector machines, random forests, and so on, they're not gone just because deep learning yeah. is there. Yeah. Um, that's why we present also yeah. the parallel support vector machine or parallel DB scan that scales very high, but still the, the traditional models have, have their yeah. use. Another one is that I find interesting is that um, you have these tableau networks. That's sort of the opposite. <laughs> so uh, in that case, you instead of giving your raw features to your models, uh, you give them to a tableau net, which builds an embedding, and then you learn about top of the embedding. Uh, and that also works very well sometimes. I think that could be a topic of another seminar. Careful, yeah, it, people. <laughs> Hunt you down for a training next year, it, maybe. It, yeah. <laughs> <All that. laughs> it works very well if you have these data sets which are very heterogeneous, like lots of columns and strings and numeric columns all mixed together. 
uh, then learning and embedding is typically very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, there's another question in the chat uh, from Fabian. Um, he is alluding to Python and R is supported and is asking if Julia is a programming yeah. language is possibly also supported. So there's a library called MLJ, machine learning for Julia. And I think they have an OpenML, at least a downloader. I'm not sure if they have an uploader. Uh, I need to check that. But that you, you can basically import any OpenML data set into Julia. Um, I'm not sure if you can upload the models as well. You need to check the status there. Or well, you should ask Diego Arenas. He's the guy doing that. Yeah, Yule is definitely becoming more and more um, used. I see that also now. Jupyter Notebook Space, we have it now, and students from me asking about it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. OK, um, any other question for the from the audience? In the moment, not maybe, maybe the, another question from yeah, yeah, please, please. Um, uh, you mentioned AWS that you did some runs there, uh, so you obviously pay for that. Um, uh, how is this usually done uh, in, in the community? How do how do people or your in your um, research group uh, uh, do you apply for computing time uh, at HPC centers to do uh, your studies, or how's it done? In this case, we just asked Amazon and they just gave us. <laughs> oh, okay, that was for free. Um, yeah, because um, they're also very interested now to know, of course. Um, so yeah, we, we got a we got a lot of support from uh, AWS for running these experiments. Okay, but like I say, it, it, the OpenML it's like completely agnostic to the libraries. Like we do a lot of uh, experiments on like typical HPC classes based on Slurm. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, there was my related question to actually how much work you would say is that so let's say we have a specific slurm script we need for our jewels cluster or for some HPC machine, um, how you would consider the the work, you know, related to this so is it an hour to tune everything that you also described a little bit in your slides, but the, the overall work intensity, let's say it depends so if. If your cluster has network access in the nodes, it's like super easy. You just, you, you, just, you just, what, what you often do is we uh, basically have uh, like a million jobs and every job is just like a number. This is the task you're, you're about to solve. And then the HTML, well, the, the script basically lands on, on a worker node says, okay, I need to fetch data set number 500. I fetch it, I run models and I upload all the results to HTML. And that's, that's like a five line script. Um, if the, what we find is a bit more work is if you, if you don't have network access in nodes, you need to like cache and then upload afterwards. That's a bit more work. Um, but yeah. I think that's the majority of our cases. So when I gave tutorials um, on, on our HPC machines, usually no one has network access on the nodes. Right. So we yeah. always download, you know, the, the kind of MNIST data for training or so on the login node. Yeah. That works, it's accessible. Yeah. Uh, to have it on the parallel file system already. And then when I do the training then on the, you know, real worker nodes or so, then it can yeah. access it. But that's downloading is impossible basically yeah. on the majority, let's say, of HPC machines we work with. The nice thing is, like, this is a script you need to write once. And then you can, yeah, like, do, like to do the, the caching and the, the storing of results and uploading afterwards. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Independent. So that was pretty important important, I think, for us to also to see um, how, how different the world is. Mm -hmm. In the backend resources we have already discussed, but um, would be also in, in a different kind of question I would have to the role of standards in your case, because obviously you get lots of different contributors, different frameworks that might be used. Uh, what is your take on ONNX, for instance, this neural open, Onyx. you know, Onyx? Yeah, basically this sure. open neural network exchange, which is of course very specific to neural networks, more or less. But standards in machine learning in general, is there something you would say um, that's really definitely worth embarking or is it something which uh, is not really mm -hmm. working at all? So what I see personally, people don't really use Onyx a lot everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, but what what is your view on these standards and Onyx and so yeah. on? So we haven't, dared to 
decide on a standard way to store models. We just store the, store the models in the way that the tools wants to store them. Um, we, I think we do have a, we have an honest integration, We're not using it a lot, but there is some code in, in GitHub that allows you to store the model in Onyx. Um, but I have to admit, we haven't used it a lot either. Um, yeah, I think Onyx is like semi-supported for TensorFlow, for instance. Um, um, yeah, but I think it's, it's very useful for, for Torch-based pipelines. Yeah, we tried to do another training on that actually, but it's also mm -hmm. hard to get speakers for that. Or to, that I mean, we have identified <laughs> a few, but uh, on LinkedIn, they don't seem to answer when we ask them or so, but okay. uh, we will try to engage on this. But my view is also when I, I review a lot of papers for AI or, or whatever, and the impact of Onyx is, is really rare there. So mm -hmm. it, it seems like, of course, also more or less a computer science problem, right? You want to dump the weights to disks and with it, the AI mm -hmm. model itself is not the, the key concern, but it's, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's, it's also a, a versioning problem. Like every time the, the tools update their versioning, the, the, the storage is different. Um, you need to update all the libraries. There's a lot of maintenance that goes into that. Um, yeah, so we have this is a little bit the idea of this race framework where we're heading to to try yeah. to avoid this because we have also lots of modules as all the different libraries but this is alluding already to the next question the change so when you think about now probably you run neural network models on on some kind of CUDA and and things like that uh, well, how you see the change um, is it affecting open ml at all basically a lot when you change the back end in terms of let's say amd cards which are coming now I think the top one number, I mean, top 500 number one uh, system, which maybe is not obvious to you, it's our benchmarking mm -hmm. of HPC machines is all actually AMD GPUs, not anymore NVIDIA mm -hmm. GPUs that broke the access scale, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and with this, of course, all is gone, right? CUDA is gone, all of that is gone. So mm -hmm. you have completely a new setup of, of rock and, and whatever uh, libraries there. Mm -hmm. How do you see that in, in the space of OpenML? Um, yeah, OpenML is pretty agnostic about this. So basically, mm -hmm. we give tasks and we ask for the, 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 the models and the, the, the results. Um, that's the only thing you upload. And you you will find it in the, in the metadata, for instance, what was used. Um, mm -hmm. We sort of expect that there's an existing environment that can run the model on the, on the client side. Right, OK. Well, that, you, that goes also then, I think, no? Please go ahead. Yeah, so if, if you use CUDA, CUDA should be installed at the client side. Otherwise, yeah, you can't even run the model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I thought like, because we also aim and raise a little bit of getting a more abstraction layer because we're getting more and more of these changes. And, and of course, uh, alongside now is Quantum as the next biggest challenge perhaps we have in integration. So there's an Ocean API in Python that you can use in some of my PhDs already do some publications and it works quite well, so to speak. But there the integration of that, let's say in inside machine learning that you can use HPC on the one side and then smoothly, you know, maybe a D-Wave Quantum Manila as an optimizer, yeah. which brings me to your flows also, right? You have also this pipelines kind of, um, this is all also completely hardware agnostic how you describe it or basically proprietary in the way you upload it. You have to have the execution environment that that you basically have there, right? Yeah, so a flow is basically a description, like how, how, basically a graph of these the components of your model and how they tie together. It says which are the hyper settings, it says which libraries are you using, which versions of libraries are you using. Um, and that's sort of it. It's basically a large JSON object. Um, mm. Yeah, so I, I could imagine that if you have this, this nice interface layer, you could store additional metadata in there that allows you to rerun models easily or to run models more easily. Um, that'd be very interesting. It, mm -hmm. it would certainly facilitate the client side aspect of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, well, basically the, the need for resources was another thing I was alluding to and thinking about that you, but you're not regularly running on Amazon. That was kind of a one package they give you as an access for the community and that's it. So when mm -hmm. other use HPC machines, so they have to bring, of course, computational time. 
um, and, and to download and then execute the scripts that you're provided. But with this bots um, that you do as a community service in one of your slides, mm -hmm. uh, this was largely than the Amazon deal you got to to have once bots created or how how is that working now the what the bots are something quite new um so the, the amazon stuff was mainly the benchmarking aspect that i showed before mm -hmm. uh the bots are something because we have all these nice outml tools uh but we, we noticed that um there, there's still uh research <laughs> um objects so um they don't always work nicely on any of the assets. We're, we're putting a lot of effort into making them very robust. Uh, and we also want them to learn um, intelligently over time because most AtML tools out there, they don't do that. They just start from scratch with every new task they see. So you want, you're working on new techniques that can learn more efficiently. Uh, but yeah, the, 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 the goal there is like, uh, so we have these bots ready or almost ready. Um, and so uh, we're currently looking for uh, resources so we can actually run these in the background uh, and mm -hmm. send the back to open mail. I think we'll, that would be a very nice service to the community. And um, uh, well, it would give us a lot of uh, interesting data to, to build better RTML systems. Yeah, I think as you have this as a EuroHPC community service basically rendered in a way, I could say there's potential chances that you get some EuroHPC JU resources from. So there are definitely calls. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but I can point you to some where there are open calls in the community. But the way we usually work is you have to justify a little bit the resource usage, right? You have to do small proposals, so to speak. Uh, but if that is, let's say, justified in, in a way not, um, you know, especially in your case, I, I would say, given that back to the community um, to do that, I think there could be high chances that this is accepted, especially because many systems are just up and running new. Not everybody knows the modus operandi since this changed away from praise a bit. Um, so that's definitely something we should maybe try. And if you have interest, we can help there a little bit uh, in race, which would be, I mean, one way around um, from basically your systems to ours. But I also would be interested of maybe making a testimonial once with, with OpenML, where we maybe take one of our remote sensing use cases and see how we can drop that, you know, in an OpenML um, space and, and then basically see and sharing that with the community. And as I suggested earlier, we see that a little bit also as a, as a two-way channel, right? The one way is we, we from the HPC-oriented AI, we really give that to the community into the OpenML, which is by far larger and more broader general AI. But on the other hand, I think then the other way channel back is of course that you as OpenML get here, there are some resource pointers, right? Where we will have some free resources available or where we could make some resources available or so. And I think we are all interested in two studies here and there. I think Lumi with the new GPU systems um, this would be quite interesting to study some elements. So I think there's definitely mm -hmm. some room there if you are interested and can maybe give us a pointer, which is a bit more technical guide, not to waste your time all the time. But if we would have someone where we can create this testimonial uh, mm -hmm. with, that would be uh, maybe a good idea. Maybe a small use case first. And then from there, we can, let's say, demonstrate that hopefully before the review or to the reviewers, then that, you know, in generally this channel would be a good idea. Of course, then it takes um, the rest of the project also to embark on that and make it bigger. Yeah. So in your eyes, it would be a good idea? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, my final question I overlooked actually is, is something where I think you mentioned in one of the slides and I have to close here soon because I have to go to the university for a master's thesis defense from one of my students. But um, the whole sort of tracking, you, you had mentioned you don't track all the runs if I correct, remember that correctly, when you do the runs and so on, you don't track everything. Um, but there are these tools like, um, we had the training ones on ML flow, clear ML. Um, there are a couple of these tools that, you know, do all the tracking of all the experiments, which yeah. is a bit similar, like your um, endeavors, so to speak, related yeah. work. Can you, do you know these activities? And if yeah, so, what would yeah. you see as different? I think, yeah. yeah, I think what we do is very similar to what Emma flow does. Um, there are some different, there's some small differences. Uh, like Emma flow is more designed as a way to track your own experiments. Like open is more designed like a way to like a collaborative approach to do mm -hmm. stuff. Um, 
so the, the, the backend is different, but uh, ultimately it's basically story models and story metadata by the models. Uh, so it's pretty general. We, um, let me see, what we don't always do by default is stuff like storing the learning curves of deep learning models. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's something that should be extensible. Uh, we're, we're going to work on that a little more next year. Um, but yeah, that's, we, we do track a lot of information about the runs. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, can all, it can always be more for particular cases, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's what I see in these tools is quite nicely that you see the learning progress that you can store mm -hmm. the different um, versions and let's say the evolution yeah. of the models in, in both yeah. directions. But what I see in your case is you spend also with these bots and with the idea of neural architecture search, so to speak, and yeah. out ML mm -hmm. much more in this direction, which I didn't saw so much in the other tools yet, at least. Yeah, it's, it's the the result of having access to, well, what we do is basically learning across thousands of, of data sets. And uh, while other tools basically here's what my one problem and I, I, I track what I'm doing here for later pur yeah, purposes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, yeah, well, I think that's all, I think, directly from my side, um, when I look at all my questions I had, of course, more technical questions I would have then later boiling into different, really, things also Andreas was already alluding to parallel IO, how that supported with such data sets and things like that. But I think for the sake of the time here in this um, training, we had already discussed a lot, but I still make another round in the audience. So if there's one, let's say, that has really a burning question, now we have here Joaquin Fora, for us here, so please go and shoot. Going once, no question. Going twice, no question again, don't be shy. <laughs> okay, two and a half, no, okay, that's all. Um, it, I think then I have just a couple of slides left to thank first of all, of course, your queen. And I would just share my screen here with a small couple of thanks slides, um, summarizing a bit, but also, of course, pointing again to some of the information here um, we have available in RACE. Um, first of all, the website, of course, you will hear more there. Um, hopefully, also at some point in the future, a news item or so, how we bridge to OpenML and how we actually work there together. Then, of course, we will hear much more our progress towards the unique AI framework and here and there something about the different hardware, software elements that we will have, but also the use cases on this website. And there you can also get information um, how we really bring this unique AI framework to life. I think today was really a good idea of having already better understanding of one of the channels, how we can bridge our two communities that are already existing. Firstly, to maybe you know, share our experience, of course, with the community, but on the other hand, also to get maybe more users on HPC systems, because what I found in one of my last um, conferences really was in an AI conference track uh, that nobody used hyperparameter optimization because largely they were AI researchers, but have no access to HPC resources. And of course, this community is traditionally not HPC oriented, having worse stations and so on. But nowadays, I think almost everyone can, can benefit from AutoML. I think also what Joaquin was saying, the bots and the idea of, of getting the models better is basically shared among many of the com community models that we have around. If you want to learn more about uh, race and generally, please look at our YouTube channel. We have there uploaded more and more of our trainings. This requires some time, some pre-processing, uh, some post-processing, post sorry, um, and then you basically find all the trainings um, there online. And also the one that you basically have heard today will be there available very soon. With this, I would like to just summarize. Um, of course, it's one party of the framework, but you have already heard it's actually touching very closely topics like MLflow and clear ML that we had in previous trainings already. Those that we maybe have in the future on Onyx, for instance, we're working on right now and that Python and so on for our framework seems to be a very good choice because appears OpenML, but all the other have really, you know, Python as the mainstream. So here, I think I would touch upon the point that we should not let it as just this training. So at least in CEO race, we would be chasing a little bit this path as one of the output channels um, and possibly also input channels for users. 
But um, you know, we'll then further continue to have, him, have maybe a testimonial at least of one use case ready in the next couple of months. And the sneak preview for you all for next uh, time in June, there will be a slightly different topic, but equally relevant, which is basically machine learning with CUDA. So we have a training given by Arnes Lechtaus there, um, who is a little bit then working one level deeper, so to speak, on the hardware level rather, and thinking about uh, how we can use and leverage CUDA resources. And one of the unique selling propositions in this particular training will be also looking into the memory usage of that. So Arnes is quite an expert in, in looking into how very well we have actually also used the memory part of the GPUs and, and so on. So this will be another um, basically topic coming up in June. I think the date is set for 9th of June, if I'm correct. And with this, I would like to say, please join us in June. More information will be coming soon on social media and our websites. Finally, thank you very much everyone for joining again and join us in June again, especially Joachim. Thank you very much for your availability. That was a great um, training. <laughs>